Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Jennifer Jett. I'm Vice President here at the FCC. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one is to please silence your phones. Um, I also wanted to remind all of our FCC members in the room that we do have our annual general meeting on Monday. I believe it's at 6 p.m. So if you can make it, please, please do come. It'll be in this room. And uh, that'll be an opportunity for us to present the new board. Uh, we will vote on a couple of article changes. And it's also an opportunity to uh, review the financial statements for the year. So um, yeah, please come, have a drink after. We would love to see you there. Um, but for today, uh, I wanted to welcome our guest, who is James Zimmerman, author of the true story, The Peking Express, The Bandits Who Stole a Train, Stunned the West, and Broke the Republic of China. Um, he has a great PowerPoint presentation that's been playing uh, during lunch, and I hope you've had a chance to look at it a little bit. Um, so this is a true story, as I said, about China's great train robbery of 1923. Uh, it's gotten some really excellent reviews, and I can, I can personally tell you it's, it's a great read. It's a true story that reads like a novel. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a story full of banditry, political intrigue, heroism, and a reflection of the excesses of the warlord era in early 20th century China. Uh, it was covered extensively in newspapers around the world and lasted for about six weeks while the bandits moved the hostages across the countryside with the Chinese army in pursuit. Um, so James uh, is a lawyer by profession who has lived and worked in Beijing for 25 years, and he did a lot of research uh, uh, in the course of writing this book, and he's going to walk us through uh, the story of the train robbery today. Um, so I'll just get right into it. Um, so this story takes place over a period of more than five weeks in May and June of 1923, so 100 years ago. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the historical context um, at this time and what was going on in China in 1923. Okay, first, first, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the FCC of Hong Kong. Really appreciate their opportunity to, to be here and be with all of you. Um, so this is very exciting for me as well uh, to be speaking. Um, but a little bit of background is um, 1923 was not a great time for China, for mainland China. It was uh, the warlord era. Um, and during that time, it was just a revolving door of warlords coming into power. Um, uh, in that year, they had a president by the name of President Lee, who was actually someone that there was great promise to, to be successful in trying to unify the country, to have a constitution that they had been drafting. And so there was a lot of high hopes that he was going to um, bring the country together and also, too, he was a reformist and wanted to do away with, with the warlords because the warlords were, you know, everyone had their own army. And, and that was a problem. When, in, when the warlords constantly fighting one another, you had a situation where when one warlord prevailed over another, you ended up having very large groups of armed men that had no jobs and they were disbanded soldiers. Um, and that meant that there was roaming the countryside, a lot of these disbanded soldiers. And rather than dealing with uh, the underlying issues, like giving people jobs, what the, the warlords were doing was going through and um, initiating a bandit suppression campaign. You know, so you had in the countryside constant fighting going on. Um, one warlord going after disbanded soldiers and just slaughtering not just the the, the bandits, as they called them, but also the villagers that got caught in the crossfire. You know, so this was going on, but at the same time, you know, the government was trying to unify the country, and the way to do that was investing heavily in the railroads. And they saw the express trains, the, you know, specifically the, the express trains going from Shanghai to Peking as a way to unify the country. So they invested a lot of money, you know, and the express trains only started, the service only started in January of 1923, so just um, four and a half months before this incident. So that's kind of the political background. You had a, the country was in a state of turmoil, a state of chaos, with all the warlords um, coming in and out of office and attacking one another, and then at the same time you had yeah, the government was also trying to drive, you know, a sense of unity by, with the railroads. 
Um, and so that is the context of by which people were boarding the train. So on January 5th, 1923, 300 people were at the Shanghai Nanking Railway Station getting ready to board the train. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about the passengers? Who, who were these people and, and what were some of their stories? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you have to um, imagine yourself at the train station in Shanghai, you know, with 300 people, and you would have heard languages, uh, English language, Spanish, you would hear Italian, German, um, Japanese, multiple, multiple Asian languages and multiple dialects of Chinese. I mean, it was a reflection really of the diversity in Shanghai at the time, but also a reflection of the visitors that were coming in from around the world. You know, in that waiting room, you would see people like uh, what are called in the story the Shanghai cousins, um, and they were the, the young men from the Jewish business community, the bankers, the stockbrokers. Um, this group of men was six of them that were on their way to Tianjin because one of them was um, in the, the spring races in Tianjin. You know, the uh, polo races, horse racing was a big deal then, so they were on their way. Um, another person that you would see in the crowd is a gentleman by the name of um, G.D. Musso, who was an Italian lawyer, very well known. His father was uh, the council general in Hong Kong for Italy in late 1800s, early 1900s. Musso was a very, very well-known lawyer. He had some shady clients, gun runners, drug runners, um, warlords, the people that operated casinos. Um, and Musso also represented the um, Shanghai Opium Combined, which is the monopoly that drove the opium trade. So Musso was there getting ready to board the train to Peking. Also in the crowd was um, a couple of R U.S. Army majors and their families and their kids. They were actually stationed in the Philippines. And just like other expats, you know, even today, you say, let's take a holiday. Let's take a holiday to, um, um, to China. You know, so they, they were there with their kids and uh, young kids and families. Um, and so there's a lot of different business people. There was honeymooners from Mexico. And one of the most conspicuous uh, uh, individuals that was in the crowd in that train station was a woman wearing an Easter bonnet, a big wide brim hat, and kind of looked out of place. But that was Lucy Aldrich, who was the sister-in-law of John D. Rockefeller Jr. So she was in China at the time. It was her second circumnavigation of the globe. She was there because she was very wealthy, very politically connected because her father was a former senator from Rhode Island. Her brother was a sitting congressman from Rhode Island. But she was very, very wealthy. And she was passing through China, going to Peking to collect exotic fabric, antiques. And so that's something that this was her second time passing through China to do that. So you had in this room, in this waiting room, 300 people. You know, you also had some relatively um, well-known Chinese passengers as well. One of those was the grandson of Wan Shikai, who was the first president of the Republic of China. So you have this very diverse group of very interesting and prominent, you know, leaders within the community, well-known around the world, that were getting ready to board the train. And you, so you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute. This, they were going to be traveling through bandit country. So why would, you, why would you put your family at risk, you know, by getting on the train, you know? Um, and that was something that you see, there was a lot of people promoting, not just the government, but all the private businesses were promoting tourism in China. To see the exotic sites in places like Nanjing or in, in Peking, Tianjin, and so forth. And so if you were sitting in the train station and you overheard somebody saying, yeah, we're going to be going through bandit country. You know, we say, oh, don't worry about it. I've got my handbook for China by Carl Crow, which this is the 1921 edition. But Carl Crow is a very, very well-known publisher and journalist. Um, he wrote um, this book, was kind of like the, the lonely planet guide, you know, for China at the time. 
um, and really pushed um, tourism. And I'm trying to find the section. I don't have my reading glasses on, but I'm trying to find the section on banditry. He has a whole section on what to expect, you know, for banditry. And I'm just about ready to find it here. So, okay, so what is he? I need to put a I need to put a bookmark in here, but um, okay. So I found it. So the section on banditry. Now I don't think Lonely Planning Guide book today has a section on banditry, but Carl Pro does. So what does he say? He says all in all, travel on the regular routes um, is as safe in China as it is in any other part of the world. Robbers and pirates exist, of course. And there is usually a revolution or rebellion going on in some part of the country. But, but these things add zest rather than danger to the journey. So you have a room full of 300 people saying, oh, don't worry about the bandits. We're going to be fine. We also, they heard that there's 17 guards that will be on the train and that the railway system has its own guard system and that there's machine gun placements on top of the carriages and the passenger cars, which the government spent a lot of money on, are bulletproof. So we're safe. So all those passengers were getting ready to board the train. So, so an attack on the train was basically the last thing any of these passengers expected. Um, and what can you tell us about the bandits who attacked the train? They were led by someone named Sun Mayao. Um, who was he? What were his goals? And why did he target foreigners in particular? Okay. Um, Sun Mayao was an interesting guy. He was actually from a very prominent, very wealthy family in southern Shandong. And he was a, an officer in a local militia that was disbanded. And he had 700 men under him. Um, and um, he was. You know, he was actually, because of another warlord, you know, uh, there was a fight. He ended up being disbanded. He decided that he wanted to go home, and his men was going to go with him. But when, on the, on, when he was traveling back to his hometown, he was confronted by the Shandong warlord that basically wanted to end these guys, is to basically um, disarm them. And so he got into battles with the warlords that did not want the competition at the local level. Now, for Sun Miao, this was, you know, this, he wanted respect. His agenda was to try to get the warlords to back off, and then also he wanted to be reinstated into an army that he would lead that would control that area of the country. He was um, very much put off by the fact that the, the warlord in power in Shandong was just slaughtering other his colleagues that were disbanded soldiers, but also the villagers that were caught in the crossfire. You know, so his agenda was not economic. It was not to, for commercial ransom. What he was looking for, it was a political agenda. So Sun Miao, his goal was to be basically reinstated into the army and recognized as the leader within that region. Um, in his group, though, he had some very, very interesting um, sub-chiefs. Um, at the time, following World War I, um, there was uh, a, a number of men that were returning, Chinese men that were returning from what is called the China Labor Corps. Um, during World War I, um, both the, the French as well as the, the British um, um, hired um, through the, chi the Chinese government over two, almost 200,000 men to go work in Europe and to support the troops on the front lines. Their jobs were you know, digging trenches or burying bodies, but they, had, they, had a, they learned quite a bit about modern machinery and modern weaponry, and they also learned a lot of the continental languages. But when these men that were part of the China Labor Corps came back to Shandong, they didn't have jobs. You know? And so they joined the army, and that, that, those people were very sophisticated. They weren't considered to be the typical bandit, someone that was engaging in banditry. Now, Su Miao's army totaled 1,000. His men were 700. There was an additional 300 that came from more of the traditional bandits that were more interested in money 
more interested in opium or alcohol and not really interested in rejoining any army. So his, his, um, his bandit army was a mixed bag, you know, and that in some respects worked against him because it was much harder for him to control those that were not the more well-disciplined, you know, soldiers. But the, the characters within the, the bandit army were just as unique as the passengers. And one of the things that we see towards the end of the story is how some of the bandits actually formed relationships, you know, with some of the hostages. And then at least two actually left the bandit camp and went to work with, you know, the, some of the hostages in Shanghai. And so that was very interesting how they, you know, had formed relationships. And those are kind of side stories in the overall story. But the, bandit, the bandits were very, very unique characters. And some of them were interesting and others were the, the ones that were the most violent were those that were more traditional bandits and also those that were children. The, there were child bandits that were very, very undisciplined and they were the ones that were tackling mostly the Chinese hostages. Now when the train was derailed, the bandits set upon the train, um, they took about 20, 28 foreigners hostage and 75 Chinese. And the Chinese that they took hostage were from the first and second class cars. They pretty much ignored the third class cars. So they focused mostly on those that, were, that can give them some leverage, some political leverage. Um, this ended up resulting in a 37-day crisis negotiating with the government as well as the involvement of the foreign government. So that's um, so, as you said, this went on for five, six weeks. Uh, how did this event move from a local event to one that was getting global headlines? And also, can you, as we're a press club, uh, there were journalists among the hostages. There were journalists who came to cover the hostage crisis. Um, what, was, what was their role in this? Yeah, they actually, the, the, the number of journalists on the train was almost 20. And they were from different media, both in Shanghai and in both the English language and other foreign language media, as well as Chinese. Um, they were actually riding the train northward to go witness a, a reclamation project on the, on the Yellow River. And this was a project that was, in, uh, that was initiated by the, and funded by the American Red Cross. So it was a kind of a, it was a big story. It was a very, actually a positive story. So you had all these correspondents on the train. Some of them escaped, and those that escaped um, actually wrote about their experiences or and, and remained uh, on the scene and were writing. And at the same time, some of them were taken hostage, and some of the, the correspondents that became hostages were actually writing and feeding letters and stories down through a, they had a kind of a postal exchange going on. And so for, um, the world, you know, the world was getting, you know, um, every single day they were getting coverage on this crisis. And so if you went back and looked at the time period, you know, uh, from May 5th until June 12th, it was, this was a front page story above the fold around the world. Now, they, the, the journalists, the correspondents actually had more information about what was going on than the government themselves. And the best example of this is that on May 6th, Sunday, May 6th, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was working uh, in his garden in Seal Harbor, Maine, just working, minding his own business, and an Associated Press reporter comes up to him and says, hey, you know, do you have any comment about the fact that your sister-in-law, Lucy Aldridge, has been taken hostage by Chinese bandits in, in the middle of nowhere? John D. Rockefeller said, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. I would have, I mean, I run, I run Sakoni, and Sakoni has offices all over China. If something happened to my sister-in-law, I would have been, I would have heard about it from Sakoni first. You know, so Rockefeller, after that conversation with the AP reporter, gets on the phone with the Secretary of State and says, what's happening in China? And the Secretary of State says, I have no idea. I have no idea, but let me, let me start sending cables back to China to find out what's going on. Sure enough, Lucy Aldrich was a hostage, was taken captive by the bandits. And so but the, it, it, show, it really showed how the media 
was so quick to get the word out around the world. And now this is before internet, this is before satellite, and this was all by, you know, by telegram that was going through sea cables around the world. So it was a pretty impressive, you know, pretty impressive job of the media in how they drove this story from not just a local issue to being a global issue. Um, and without giving anything away, uh, the, the book describes the train robbery as breaking the Republic of China. How did it break the Republic of China? I mean, in a number of ways. This one is I mentioned that President Li was a, considered a reformer. He was um, popular not just with, with um, the Chinese people, but also with foreigners. You know, that thought that he was going to do away with the warlord system, that he was going to be, um, you know, he was going to unify the country with the Constitution. So there was a lot of hope for President Li. But he was driven out of office by warlord Sao Kun, who felt that one, Lynch, the, what is called the Lin Chung incident, had weakened him. One and two, that the, he allowed the foreign governments to basically dictate how to solve the issues. You know, so it was a big embarrassment. Um, this incident was a real embarrassment for the, the government. So on the last day when the, the hostages were actually released on June 12th, he was driven out of office, you know, and he, had, he was forced out of office. And then Sao Kun came in, and he himself didn't last more than a year. Now, in addition to the change of leadership, the thing that really, really hurt China was the fact that in 1923, there was a discussions about revoking extraterritoriality. Now, historically, extraterritoriality was something that was negotiated in the unequal treaties that um, imposed a lot of conditions on um, having concessions and having, you know, court systems in China for the foreign governments and so. You know, the, the British government, the U.S. government, Japanese, Germans, and so forth, all had their own court system. And so, and that was, those were extraterritorial courts. And it made, what it did was, you know, um, foreign nationals were basically immune from being subject to Chinese law. Now, that was something that China considered to be a um, violation of its sovereignty. It was considered to be a, something that, was very embarrassing. And so um, starting from the Qing government all the way through the Republican government, there was talks about reversing extraterritoriality. And that was set to take place in November of 1923. They had a commission set up which would structure the changes. You know, to get to that point, China revised its criminal laws, it revised its commercial laws, it built up its court system, so it felt that it was ready to basically retake its court systems back. But because of Lin Chang, because of the Peking Express robbery and hostage crisis, all the foreign governments said, we're not giving up on extraterritoriality. And it, it, didn't, it wasn't revoked until World War II. So for 20 more years, you know, extraterritoriality remained in place. Now, what did that mean? It actually weakened the Republican government. It was so embarrassing for them, and it, and it actually strengthened the communist government. It, the party, and, um, Mao himself used the Lin Chung as an example, you know, of basically imperialism, you know, and the fact that they were not able to drive out or change the course of extraterritoriality was another thing that strengthened, you know, the, the communist party. You know, so it did it did break the Republic of China. It re broke the Republic not just by the loss of President Li, but also the, the issue, which was a very important issue, was the issue of extraterritoriality. And going back to the hostage crisis, uh, the hostages were in captivity for weeks in very challenging conditions. How, how did they get through it and what was their experience like? What was it like for them? Now, Carl Crow himself stepped up to the plate um, part of it was because he wrote a passage saying, don't worry, don't worry about Bannon. So anyway, Crow came in and created what was called the American Rescue Mission. And it was actually funded by the American Red Cross. Um, and he was one of the leaders with the American Red Cross chapter in Shanghai. 
And what they did for the, actually for the first week, they, they really, the hostages didn't have a whole lot of food. You know, so they were eating, eating mostly local stuff, local fare, which wasn't great. Um, and even the bandits themselves did not have enough food. So with the rescue mission, they started what was called the, you know, it's not, not a politically correct term, but they called the Cooley Express, where they were sending provisions up, carried up the mountainside, you know, uh, over 30, you know, for 1.30 miles. It was a long haul up the mountain. And, and you can see in one of the slides, the mountain itself is where they were located, which was Pazuku Mountain. But the, um, so they created, um, this express process, oh, excuse me, this uh, rescue process where they were sending up provisions. At the same time, they also started a mail service. And Carl Crow himself created postage stamps. Uh, and those postage stamps were called Bandit Post. Now, this, this was kind of a, this was a side story, but it became a big deal because uh, people that were in the stamp collecting world saw these stamps and they thought, oh, they're issued by, by the Sun Miao himself. And so the price of these stamps started going through the ceiling. And even today, the, the Shandong government, they issued this two weeks ago, but they issued a, a you know, stamp cover envelope. This is Pazuku Mountain, and these are the, the bandit post stamps or a photocopy of them. But they created, you know, um, not just sending up provisions, but they created a mail service. And this, this is one reason why there was so much coverage in the daily news, because the, the, the journalists, the correspondents that were uh, in the bandit camp were sending messages and letters, you know, back and forth. And then, and so the word got out. Um, so, um, but anyway, they, it was, a, it was very difficult to, I mean, uh, being up in the, the the banding camps because of certain lack of food and lack of water. The rescue mission helped with that, but because the army was constantly attacking where they were at, it was a situation where, I mean, they were constantly afraid of being in the crossfire. So it's not like people felt safe, you know, and it was um, so coping, as you ask, how did they cope? They coped as best as they could. Um, while negotiations were going on to try for the release. So without um, giving away the ending, you know, um, it doesn't end well for some. You know, if you, if you actually read the New York Times or Wall Street Journal um, uh, book reviews, they kind of, there's a few spoiler alerts on that, but um, it doesn't end very well for some. But they, the government, the Chinese government, was unable to really negotiate a, an arrangement um, until they actually brought in an American negotiator to do, to work with, uh, come up with a resolution with, with the um, with the bandits. And are there any lessons or implications from from this hostage crisis that you think we can learn from today? Today. Um, I mean, I've been asked that question a number of times, and, um, in my, and this is more of my personal opinion. I don't really go into a lot of detail. It's mentioned at the end of the bo book, some of the things that I see that are, uh, from a, a comparative view, um, still exist today that are issues, you know, that happened in 1923. So the, the implications are there. And one of those is the economic divide. You know, that was a big, that was one of the reasons why all of this happened, is we had this very, you know, wide economic divide that still is something the leadership in Beijing today is still struggling with. You know, they're still struggling with their poverty alleviation, the chaos back then, you know, and the, you know, life in the villages, you know, was, was not really great. And so that was something that was clearly, there is, you know, implications back from 1923 that you have today. The other thing that um, um, is an issue is, you know, back in 1923, the warlords in power were very, very quick to basically label people as bandits. You know, now, banditry really involves some form of theft, you know, in order to be truly a bandit, you know. But what happened is by labeling people as bandits, just because they have a, an opposing view 
or they are taking up arms against you um, was without any kind of due process. And so that actually enabled the Chinese army to basically round up and execute people. So back in 1923, the use of the term bandits was excessive. Now, fast forward 100 years later, you know, it's my personal opinion, and I, because I, this is some of the things I see in my daily job as a lawyer, is that in the, uh, China today, sometimes the government is very, very quick to label people as troublemakers, you know, those that may be causing trouble because they raise questions about the government leadership or whatever, and it's almost the same thing. You're labeling somebody you know, as a troublemaker and then basically giving them a jail sentence and how much due process is in that. You know, so just blunt, you know, bluntly labeling somebody as either a bandit or as a troublemaker is, is something that's very concerning. And, you know, 100 years later, I don't think they've really completely, you know, corrected that. Now, the other thing, the third thing I see is in with the treatment of the, of the media. Back in 1923, the, the warlords in power were really trying to stop the correspondents from reporting on this every day. And they were trying to really, yeah, they actually shut down some of the tele you know, telegram, um, telegraph offices so that the reporters could not send stories out. Send, um, and so what the reporters were doing, you know, when um, something came down from the bandit camps, what they did was send a runner to Shanghai and telegraph, sent the telegraph out from Shanghai because at the local level, the government was trying to control the message. So fast forward to, 19, uh, to 2023 is that you still have governments, not just China, but around the world that are trying to micromanage the message. You know, so for journalists, you know, that's something that, you know, is a personal issue. And so that's something that was a, an implication from 1923 to today. So there's a couple of things, the comparative issues that happened back then that still exist today. Um, and can we learn from that? Well, the, the thing we learn is, is that we still haven't corrected some of these issues, especially when it comes to the economic divide, especially when it comes to earmarking somebody, you know, as a troublemaker or as a bandit. Um, last question, and then, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, can you tell us what is the Hong Kong connection to this story? Okay. Here's a, um, one I mentioned Musso. Musso, um, in his uh, interest in um, the, uh, the uh, South China Morning Post, I actually, in my research, um, had to pull Musso's probate file. Um, and from the late 1938 is when he passed away, and then the probate file was in the 40s. But I had to pull those records to see what his interest was because he was one of the original shareholders. So that's the connection. The other is with two of the um, hostages, um, the Elias brothers, who were what, we, what are termed in the book as the Shanghai cousins. I mean, they were from the Jewish community in Shanghai. Um, after World War II, um, they moved down to Hong Kong and then they thrived in the community here. And the two brothers, Eddie Elias and Freddie Elias, are actually buried in the Jewish um, cemetery here in Hong Kong. So, you know, there is a, a Hong Kong connection to the story. Um, and, and the other thing is on, on, the, on the Elias brothers, they're very, very interesting people. Um, Eddie Elias actually um, served in what is called the Oriental Mission which uh, uh, was with the British, British intelligence during World War II. So a very, very interesting story. All this happened after, after 1923, of course. Um, but yeah, there is clearly a Hong Kong connection here um, to the story. But, um, and, uh, and, that, and also a, a number of the people that were involved in the story actually either moved, either they're not buried here, but they moved and worked here and before they went elsewhere. All right, um, let's uh, take some questions. Uh, please identify yourself and your organization, if any. Uh, we'll start with Wayne. Hi, my name is Wayne Ma. I'm, I'm a reporter at The Information in Hong Kong. I'm um, trouble with him. James, I, I wanted to ask, uh, how did you do research for the book? Did you travel anywhere? 
obviously you can't interview people, <laughs> anyone who was there at the time. Can you explain a bit about how you gathered all the material? And, uh, and did you find anything that you know, wasn't very public or, or whatnot? I was just very curious if there was anything unique about what you found as well. Uh, so the question was, how did you do the research for the book? And did you find anything that wasn't uh, public knowledge before? The, um, when I was going through, when I first came across the story, because I, I did a lot of writing on extraterritoriality about the US court system in China. Um, and so I came across a number of the characters in the story in those government records on the court system. What I did from that point on was get into government records in, in, um, in both specifically in Nanjing, um, government records in Hong Kong, London, the US, and, and throughout the world, digging into government records about the incident. That ended up leading me to the descendants of the hostages and the rescuers. And I, I really knew at that time when I started to find the family records that I had a story, I had a book, um, because uh, there was families that I um, that I, I tracked down that nobody had contacted them since the 20s, and they had boxes and boxes of photographs. They had diaries. One one of the U.S. majors, uh, Major Pinger, his family is in Oregon, in um, in the U.S., and they they, they stuff had, hadn't been pulled out of the basement since the tw um, since the 20s. Um, or not the 20s, around the 30s when he had compiled it all. But, I mean, he had photographs and he had his own 175-page diary for the 37-day incident. And it was so detailed, it would allow me to put myself in the shoes um, of, the, uh, of them. And then there was a lot of letters. And so I, w I was able to dig up records from probably 20 descendants of either the rescuers um, or, or hostages, uh, as well as to talk to people that were like the grandchildren that remember, you know, those stories that were being told, you know, and I was able to do that throughout the world in trying to find people. And so it, for me, when I was able to locate those family records, and a lot of these photographs came from, you know, the files of those that, especially the ones up at the temples, up at the bandit camps, um, because during that 37 days, there was two people that actually received cameras, and so they were able to take photographs while they were in captivity. You know, so finding that stuff was a treasure trove to work with. And, um, but if I was only to find the government records, I didn't think I would have had a good enough story. It was finding all of the um, all of the records of the family members. Now, that included the two of the Chinese captives. Um, and the interesting thing too, and this is changing the subject a little bit, but um, I, I go to Pazuko Mountain a lot, and so I was up at Pazuko Mountain in March, and po on Twitter I posted a bunch of photos of me being up there. Um, so, um, and this was uh, the first week in March. My office, um, I got a call at my office Monday after the weekend that I posted everything on Twitter and got a call from a, the local um, Shandong government. One of the party officials said that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that follows me on Twitter, you know, was, saw the photos and they saw that the, the story, the book was, um, it was, has out and they wanted to meet. So to make a long story short, um, uh, at the 100th anniversary of the event, I was in Shanghai, then took the train up to, um, to Shandong. The local Shandong government actually, you know, put on big banquets and everything on that, but they also brought in descendants of the bandits, you know, and one of the people that was kind of like the guest of honor was the grand nephew of Sun Miao. Now, he was 69 years old, so he wasn't around in 1923, but I asked him and talked to him about what kind of stories he heard about his you know, great-grand-uncle. And, so, and it was amazing, some of the things that they were saying. It didn't, you know, this happened after I wrote the book, so it didn't change the story, but you know, they kind of confirmed you know, some of the things that I had heard and read about Sun Miao. But I think the real, the, the thing that the real value in, for me in writing this book was all of the family, 
you know, the, the information, the letters and the diaries and the statements that they had was just an amazing resource that really helped me with writing this. Um, other questions? Robin Harding from the Financial Times. Um, thank you for the presentation, Jim. Um, I wondered, is the perception of this historical event in China, uh, I mean, you've obviously dug into it in great depth. Do you feel any difference between how this event is remembered inside China and how you see it having written the book yeah. on it? Just, just, just so you know, because of my hearing, there's an echo here, but I'm going to have, a, uh, she's going to kind of tr repeat okay. it for me, just so you know. It's not that I heard you, but I want to make sure I understand. Uh, so the question was about how this event is perceived in China, and if you uh, perceive any difference between the way it's seen in China and what you found in your own research. Um, I think that there, um, when I originally started working on this in 2015, there was a lot of resistance to the story at the local level, and I was asking government officials, they, because it was, it was not a great time, but um, after, you know, the events this, in, May, in May of this year, and, and talking about this with the local government today, I think they are more in line to accept my version of the story than the version that was actually from the warlord government from 1923. Because in the research, you know, that I found, the warlord in power at the time, um, he wrote his own report, which was completely wrong, and it was, it was basically to defend himself, you know, and he was trying to justify why they were going after uh, attacking the, the bandits and not backing off. And so it was a very one-sided viewpoint. But to answer the question, though, is today, I think that there's going to be, um, I think that you will find more and more the government's willing to embrace the story as it's written. The only thing that I think that we, I think we'll find that's different is that the, the government's going to try to put some more blame on the foreign governments that were, they sense were pressuring you know, the government at the time. But I, I don't think the, the government today is going to defend the, the warlords back in 1923. Because, in fact, after, you know, after this incident, two years after it, Mao himself got up and started talking about the Lin Chung incident as a reason why the people needed the party. So he was used this. They used this to basically promote the party. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, Morgan. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Morgan. I'm a board member here. Um, I, not to have any spoilers, but I found the references to Japan maybe, maybe not being involved in the incident very interesting. And I know you said, you know, it was never proved, but the Japanese passengers got off the train early. What are your personal thoughts on the Japan involvement or lack thereof? Yeah, your thoughts on the involvement of potential yeah. involvement of Japan. Um, the, the thing is that was a question that was raised because it, it, the, the facts were that all of the Japanese passengers exited the train. Um, and there were Japanese officials for um, um, chambers of commerce that were on the train, that were on the manifest. They get off the train at the last stop. So that has been proven. Well, the issue of the involvement of the Japanese government, meaning Tokyo, um, the U.S. did its own study. The U.S. government did its own study and said there was no evidence of involvement. Now, um, I'm inclined to believe that, that I don't think that Tokyo would do that openly, but however, you know, they had a lot of people working as gun runners and a lot of interest on the ground in Shandong. And the fact that they had just given back um, Qingdao, Tsingtao, you know, six months before was, I mean, they had a lot of, they had a lot of people on the ground. So, and they also were not happy at the fact that they gave back Tsingtao to the Chinese government. So there may have been a reason to try to initiate the, the crisis. You know, my personal view is maybe they might have done that 
um, by way of encouraging gun runners to supply weapons to the bandits, by getting the word out to the Japanese passengers to get off the train. Um, but I don't think there is direct evidence. I mean, I would say I know there's no direct evidence that Tokyo called the shots on this or initiated it. You know, I couldn't find any of that. But it's part of the story. I brought it up, and, and basically at the end, basically said talk about the the fact that the U.S. government could not prove that. Um, but it's very just interesting. It's just interesting because all the all the Japanese bailed off at the last station, you know, and you kind of wonder as why. And then every, almost all of the the hostages saw Japanese guns. You know, and they're like, you know, that's very odd. You know, no Japanese passengers, but a lot of the bandits are using Japanese weapons. You know, so it creates a lot of suspicion, but couldn't really prove that Tokyo was the one that directed this. Uh, yes. And echo. I'm sorry. Uh, Nick Thompson, no affiliation whatsoever. Um, are there reports by other countries? about this uh, incident. You've given the, uh, the American re report into it, but were the, the British or the um, Italians or the French made any reports? Were there reports by other countries about this incident from the British, the French, the Italians? We have the US government perspective, but did you find government reports from other countries? Um, yes, I'm actually, um, the, the perspective that I got was primarily from the um, actually from all four governments. Basically, the four governments that were on site, the British, American, as well as the Italian and French, were all of the, basically, of the same opinion. You know, so in the research that I had and covered, they, they were actually, um, they, they all took the same approach with the Chinese. They basically said, this is your problem, you need to fix it. Um, but there was debates, where there was debates between the four countries, was whether there should be military intervention, you know, because the, the actually the British were trying to lead that. Well, we maybe we should have uh, foreign military intervention. Um, the French, as well as the Italians and the the U.S., said no, the timing's not right for that, you know. So there was a little bit of discussion, but for the most part, the four of them stuck together uh, because they wanted China to solve this. Now, where there was actually a lot of um, debate was uh, between the four governments is the timing for the release of the, the hostages. Of course, the Italians wanted their guy released first. You know, of course, the French wanted their people released first. And so they were, there was a little bit of infighting on that. You know, so there was a little bit of diversity of, of views on whether Musso should have been released first because he was in poor health and so forth. But overall, I mean, I've tried to give a balance of the different viewpoints from the four governments. Um, and, um, you know, and it de actually depended on how much stuff I actually found on that. And there was a lot of record um, in actually four governments. And there was other, other governments also kept records because um, specifically um, Denmark, and then um, also um, in the in German records for the their people that escaped from the train actually gave statements. Um, and there's also records from because um, in the diplomatic community in Peking there was unity within all of the governments, and that, that was actually led by the minister from Portugal. You know, so there was a lot of I mean the foreign involvement was pretty significant. And the records that I've been able to locate are, um, are pretty significant on the different viewpoints of the government. So, um, but for the most part, I was able to demonstrate that they were unified, except when it came to when and who to release. You know, um, so. Um, any last? And what were the repercussions of uh, paying compensation, et cetera? Who, who owned the, who the, owned rail, the railway, the railway yep. and did they have to pay any compensation? The, yeah, good, that's a very good question. The, the owners, actually, the, the stretch of the rail the, um, between, between uh, Pukong and Tianjin 
which is Pukou, was Nanjing to Tianjin, was actually owned by the Chinese government. It was the first rail um, line that was owned by the Chinese government. From Shanghai to Nanking, that was still had British interests, even though it was Chinese owned. There was still some British involvement, you know, from a, a lending perspective. But in 1923, the Pukou to Tianjin line was owned by the Chinese government. Now, there was compensation paid by the central government, and that was paid two years after the fact. Um, if actually, if there was ever um, any dis um, comments by the, the leadership today about the rights and wrongs of all this, the payment of compensation, you know, which took place in 1925, I think even today Beijing would say, we should have never done that. These people were criminals, you know. So, um, you know, that was, that was a big issue. But compensation was paid for all of the foreign hostages, but not the Chinese hostages. Um, that, um, but the Chinese central government was the one that paid the compensation. I think that's, I mentioned that in the book and actually in the back, in the footnotes. All right, well, I think we have to end there, but thank you so much, thank James you. Zimmerman, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the book, I understand, is currently sold out in Hong Kong. How can yeah. people get it? Yeah, it's sold out in Hong Kong, but it's on um, Bookazine as well as Kelly and Walsh are trying to, are going to get more stock in. And so uh, they anticipate by in the next week or so, there'll be more books out there. I'm down here quite often. So I'm happy to, if it's signed someone's book, and I'm sorry that they're not available today. But um, actually, you can, e I'm pretty accessible. You can email me or text me and, you know, to arrange. And I'm happy to stop by your office and sign the book if you'd like. But, but anyway, but, um, but yeah, it'll be available in Bookazine um, as well as Kelly and Walsh very soon. Great. Thank you again, and thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Okay, thank you.